to, to talk to you today about William Livingston's world. So William Livingston is the first democratically, popularly elected governor of New Jersey. And we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about his background and why I think he's, he's so important. So William Livingston's world is the name of um, an NEH funded grant project that myself and my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Hyde at Kane, have been working on for the last four years. So this presentation is funded by your state tax dollars and also by your federal tax dollars. You can decide if that makes you feel better or worse, but um, but it makes me feel but it makes me feel better. And so this is a we are coming up to the end of this project. We uh, we have to spend all of our money down by June 30th. And we've got a couple of final things that that we are doing with regard to that. It's really aimed at a couple of things. It was aimed at. It's not so much recovering the history of William Livingston, but I think expanding people's knowledge of, of William Livingston. But what we've also found is that studying Livingston, and, and I think this would go for studying any founding father, because we do have such a strong documentary record, we can use Livingston's story or any founder's story and get at some of the deeper historical questions that are frequently more difficult to get at, right? Particularly the lives of women, the lives of the enslaved, the lives of people for whom we don't have as much recorded in the documentary record. And so one of the things that we've done, our students have done as a part of this project, is to try and tease out some of those other stories about what can be known about William Livingston's world. And one of the things that we quickly discovered is that William Livingston's world encompasses quite a lot, right? This is the premier political family of, of New Jersey. Um, and intersects with the Kane family, right? So the school that pays my regular salary. Um, and again, kind of continuing to be a, a first family in New Jersey politics. Even in the present day, I think Tom Kane Jr. is once again running for Congress and has a, a seat that looks more winnable than the last time he ran. So, um, so, we'll, see what, so we'll see what's happening about that. So, so Livingston kind of gives us access to, to all of those uh, people. The Livingstons are not just in New Jersey, although we think of them as New Jersey. They originally come from New York. Well, they originally come from Holland and England, but um, are very much a part of New York politics as well as New Jersey politics, own um, land and claim ownership over enslaved persons in South Carolina and Georgia. Um, Edward Livingston, so a cousin of Williams, is actually Secretary of State under Jefferson and is part of the team that negotiates the Louisiana Purchase with Napoleon and his crew in, in 1803. So William Livingston's world is, encompasses, encompasses quite a lot. Uh, the short version of William Livingston is he the first popularly elected governor of New Jersey. He won re-election 14 times. Governor elections were annual at that time. Imagine if we could have a governor election every year. How much fun would that be? Yeah. Um, and so he, with the term limit, with the, the two four-year term limits, Livingston will, at least for the foreseeable future, be the longest ever serving governor in New Jersey's history as well. He had been a, he was a lawyer by training, uh, but he fancied himself as a writer. His first position in, in a even not quite yet independent New Jersey was he was elected as the first Brigadier General of the New Jersey Militia. He had been in, in Philadelphia at the Second Continental Congress um, up until June of 1776, so just prior to the Declaration. He is not a signer of the Declaration. And he was very much a moderate in Philadelphia where he was looking for ways to reconcile with Great Britain and, and was a late convert to independence. But once he got on board with independence, he was all in on independence. So his first position was as Brigadier General of the New Jersey Militia. He was not well suited for that. He was a learned man. He was a very gifted writer. He was, from my reading, an incredibly smart person. I'm out of camera. Uh, but at the same time, he was not a military man. He does not seem to have been particularly well read in military affairs and, and recognized that he wasn't very good. He was very good at being a wartime governor and also a, a peacetime reconciliatory governor of the state during the American War for Independence and in the decade that followed up until his death in 1790. 
And, and so for, for a lot of ways, right, Livingston is, is very much the leading figure of New Jersey in the revolutionary era. So Philosophic Solitude is a poem that he actually wrote and published in 1747. Um, Livingston was educated at Yale and liked to brag about it, I think is probably a, a fair way to put it. So, his poem, Philosophic Solitude, came with a whole bunch of classical references that another very well-educated person at that time would have gotten, but that you and I would not get without doing a whole lot of homework and really reading the footnote, right? But in, in Philosophic Solitude in 1747, Livingston really laid out um, what, what he believed to be the political principles of an independent wealthy gentleman. I mean, he was the original like inherited privileged wealth person, right? Um, but also what he wanted his ideal life to be. And central to that ideal life was a rural retreat, a rural home where books and close friends were privileged over more comfortable um, surroundings. He, he had a garden, and, and so he built that at Liberty Hall. So his home, Liberty Hall, which is part of King's campus, which he retired from legal practice in New York in 1770, announced that he was moving to Elizabeth, which you all think of as the city at the time was like living out in Maine or even further out. Um, his daughters were not pleased to leave Lower Manhattan and to come out to Elizabeth, um, but he did, and so he built his home, which was at the time a 12-room mansion, which would have been large by those standards. It's vastly expanded since then. Um, and Kane is, once again, Liberty Hall is, I don't understand the relationship anymore. I should, but I don't. But anyway, it's on our campus. They run really interesting tours. They have a lot of other programming that's worth taking a trip, particularly on, on a nice spring day like this. You can get into the gardens and, and also out there. Um, and so one of the things that we get to do because we have access is that we can take students into Liberty Hall and have the conversation with them about Livingston and about what he wanted to build in the room that he built himself, in the room that his daughter was actually married to John Jay in 1774. Um, and so it's kind of a cool way to, to, to look at it, right? And so there's an early picture of Liberty Hall, and, and Livingston himself named it Liberty Hall, which strikes us as somewhat egocentric, but I think also speaks to how he envisioned himself as part of this revolutionary movement and in, and in leading New Jersey during the revolutionary movement. So if we fast forward a bit to 1776, one of the things that we've discovered in our work, and, and we being myself, um, Dr. Hyde, and a very variety of different students that we've embar employed kind of on the project, sometimes in classes that we've taught where this is their research assignment and stuff related to this is their research, and we've been able to pay some research assistance as well. Um, one of the things we've recognized is there's pretty regular correspondence between Livingston and Washington from the time that he assumes first this brigadier generalship of the New Jersey militia, and secondly as governor. There's a bit of a gap where Washington seems to be like, oh, you're not the general anymore, I need to talk to the general, I'm not gonna write the governor, and then quickly realizes that there's no one else to talk to and that Livingston is in fact the one person who can get anything done in the state, and so then their correspondence picks up. And then there's a gap from early December of 1776 until mid-January of 1777. If you know your history of the American Revolution at all, what's happening in New Jersey in December of 1776? This is the Audithians participation part. <laughs> that would be the Battle of Trent, right? So first is the retreat across New Jersey, and if you look here, this blue, um, the blue dash line is essentially the American army, the Continental Army, retreating all the way across New Jersey, and then across into Pennsylvania, and then coming back for the Battle of Trenton, and they have that misdated, uh, coming back for the Battle of Trenton in 1776. So, the sub so Livingston and Washington are writing each other pretty regularly until early December. They're writing each other pretty regularly again from like late January. And so the supposition is, and I think it's the correct one, is that Livingston is traveling with the army. So he doesn't need to write letters to Washington because he can just go knock on his tent and say, hey, What's, what, what can we do here? But also, this is, in many ways, the nadir of the war in New Jersey, right? Where the Continental Army has basically been pushed across. The British Army, with their Hessian uh, mercenary supporters and, and comrades at arms, are very much in the ascendancy, occupying all of North and, and certainly Northeast and Central, if 
you believe there is a central jersey. Um, uh, but but certainly that that part of the state, right? And so, but again, we have this mystery, and it's frustrating because we don't have anything in Livingston's hand about what's happening and his impressions of the army and the campaign and everything else that is going on. So this correspondence between Livingston and Washington would would continue and continue pretty regularly throughout the war. New Jersey is, of course, the crossroads of the American Revolution. We style ourselves that way, and that's because it's actually true, right? If you think about the British, our main, their main base is in New York. The uh, American capital is in Philadelphia, and New Jersey, of course, is right in between the two. So you've got armies traversing the state the whole time. New Jersey has more battles, skirmishes, etc., than any other state during the war for American independence, and it's really not. And Livingston is very central to it all, as now the state's governor. So his correspondence with Washington continues to be very active. Washington is constantly asking for troops, constantly asking for supplies, and Livingston is trying to convey that to the New Jersey Assembly. You know, one of my very favorite Livingston speeches is a speech he gives in in February of 1777. And so, it's February 25th, 1777, he's giving his, this address to the New Jersey Assembly, and he concludes it, quote, let those in more distinguished stations use all their influence and authority to rouse the supine, to animate the irresolute, to confirm the wavering, and to draw from his hold the skulking neutral, who leaving to others the heat of the burden of the day, means in the final result to root the fruits of that victory for which he will not contend. Let us be particularly assiduous in bringing to punishment those detestable parasites who have been openly active against their native country. Like I said, he was fancy educated and he wanted to show it off, but a gifted propagandist, probably the most gifted propagandist of anyone in the American Revolutionary Era. So the American, the war for independence in New Jersey is very much a civil war. You have plenty of people who are siding with the British, and that's a logic, based on who you think is going to win, that's not necessarily, a, that's a very logical uh, assumption, and because of the presence of British troops, it's in some ways at least a life-saving or an estate-saving decision to, to side with the British. You don't have anyone in the assembly necessarily who's openly advocating for Britain, but you have a lot of people who are trying to hedge their who are trying to hedge their bets. I don't have the names necessarily at my disposal. Livingston is constantly frustrated that he can't get the assembly to act more quickly, and so one of the things that he's trying to do in that and he's calling out people not just in the assembly but other people who are selling supplies to the British army, for example, right? He's got a lot of deserters in his in the New Jersey militia, a lot of deserters in the Continental Army, many of whom are just going home. Some are actually changing sides and, and going over to the British. But Livingston is very, very mindful that this is a very much a civil war in a way that what we call, one of my ongoing arguments is that what we call the American Civil War is really the American Revolution, and what we call the American Revolution is really a civil war. Because it's much more neighbor against neighbor in the, in the, civil, in the revolutionary war than actually it is in what we call the American Civil War, right? Which is a different conversation, but that's what we're getting at. So, so, but Livingston is calling out everyone, and he is really consistent with having a very, very hard line on deserters, on having a very, very hard line on people who are not just supporting the British, but even those who aren't supporting the revolutionary cause. If you're, you know, okay, if you're selling supplies to the British, yes, they're absolutely going to come after you, but even if you're not willing to sell supplies to the Americans, and there are reasons not to do so because the money wasn't really worth much, he, would, he was very critical of those kinds of people and, and passed or tried to get passed and did succeed in passing a number of laws to give him and to give local authorities greater ability to seize supplies, to demand that, that men muster when the militia was being called out and things like that. Co co coercive was he? <coughs> he signed off on the execution of a couple of people. Is that coercive enough? This is New Jersey. We play, we play hardball here. Right? So, so this relationship with the assembly is, is continually fraught, um, but by 1777 he does get them to pass essentially a, a structure where there's an executive committee. Right? Because Livingston is constantly on the move. So one of the things that you have to understand is that 
the revolution, or, or the capital of New Jersey, is wherever Livingston happens to be at the time. And so I tracked his movements just for the second half of 1777. So from July through December of 1777, he starts July in Morristown. He goes as far north as Sparta. He comes down to New Brunswick, Princeton, spends about four weeks in the fall in Haddonfield, across the river from Philadelphia, if you know that part of the world at all, because yeah. the Continental Congress is meeting in Philadelphia, but also the British Army is coming up from Chesapeake Bay to attack Philadelphia at that time. He then goes back to Trenton and Princeton, and he spends New Year's Eve at Ringo's Tavern, which is, there's a town Ringo's outside yeah. Flemington, if you've been out to that part of the world. So we tracked him at over 400 miles traveled. Now, and that's, that's a rough estimate, because basically he had to use Google Maps, so we're using roads, not horse trails or whatever you want to use, but roughly he travels over 400 miles just in the span of that six months. He's not in any one place for, he's, the longest he's anywhere is in, is in Haddonfield for about four weeks, where the assembly is also meeting and they're across from the Continental Congress. But it's very much, wherever Livingston is is where the capital is. Livingston is on the move because there's a variety of plots to try and kidnap or assassinate him. He survives at least one assassination attempt and a couple of kidnapping attempts. Um, his son, who's otherwise a pretty much a ne'er-do-well overhears is, is in a tavern, he's an alcoholic, and he's in a tavern and he overhears this plot to essentially to try and, they don't know who he is, to try and like kidnap his, mm -hmm. capture his dad and kidnap his dad. And the one thing he gets right with his dad is he sends him a letter and says, hey, um, keep, your, keep, your, keep your eyes open and your, and, your, and your ears open. So, the story that I referenced about Livingston signing off on the execution of, of two men was um, these two men, James Eliff and, and John Mee. And so this again is in, this is in the fall of 1777. There's a British officer and a loyalist militia officer who are going through eastern Pennsylvania and then primarily in Hunterton County gathering men to join the, a British militia. So they've got almost 100 men, and they're basically trying to get from Hunterdon County to Staten Island, where the British Army is located. They get surrounded and captured by a New Jersey militia group. And so they're all thrown into jail in Morristown. They're all taken to Morristown and put, in, and put into jail. Um, one of the really interesting documentary records that's at the State Archives in Trenton is letters from primarily the wives and mothers of, of these men, basically asking, written to Livingston, asking for him to pardon them. Um, and talking about basically like, my son is an idiot and got misled by so and so and he doesn't really care and please don't execute him. Um, executions worked a little bit differently in, in the colonial and revolutionary period and we'll, and we'll talk about that. So Livingston, releases some of them. Most of them he releases on condition that they join the Continental Army. And he actually writes this long letter to Washington and says, I'm sending you a bunch of men who had been condemned but have agreed you know, to, to have their, their death sentence waived in order to join the Continental Army. We could debate whether or not that's a death sentence or not. Livingston's like, because I don't believe they were in the British Army by any because of ideology, it was just opportunity, I think they will serve just fine in the American army, because you don't want a bunch of people who are actively fighting against you that you think are on your side. Um, they don't fight against the Continental Army, but basically they all deserve as soon as possible. So by July of 1778, they've all deserved. And Livingston didn't really think that would happen, so that was one miscalculation on it. There's certain parts of human nature Livingston's not great at, and that was argued. But these two men, James Eliff and John Mee, were two of the ringleaders. Um, and in fact, they had fired upon those militia soldiers when they were initially surrounded. And so these two were singled out. And we have correspondence that goes back and forth, including between Livingston and Washington, basically saying, this is what's going on. Um, do you have any suggestions? Uh, do you have any suggestions for, for what I do? So James Moody was a British lieutenant. Um, and Eliff was a loyalist from Hunterdon, from Hunterdon County. So Livingston wrote, in October, there's a considerable number of state prisoners who were taken on their way to join the enemy on Staten Island, um, the greater part of whom will be convicted of high treason. A sound policy will require the execution of the ringleaders. 
so humanity and mercy will interpose on behalf of the more ignorant and deluded. Again, over the course of that following month, Livingston received numerous appeals from, uh, from the family. And later on in November, uh, Livingston updated Washington, right, on, of the prisoners condemned at Morris, 23 were pardoned on condition of enlisting, nine reprieved until the 2nd of January, and two to be executed tomorrow. The wife of John Nee uh, went so far as to visit the governor's daughter to ask her to intercede on her husband's behalf. And Susanna did write her father with the details of that conversation, but didn't make any, certainly didn't make any, any promises. And James Eliff himself submitted two petitions to Livingston, and both are in the state archives. The first one, he basically was consistent with these other ones, saying that you know he uh, acknowledged being guilty of crime of treason, that he had been an enemy to my country, quote, but a far greater one to myself and my unfortunate and numerous family, and he asked for mercy for the sake of his wife and children, five children. After he was sentenced to death, however, he submitted a second petition. And in this, he more fully outlines his service to the British Army and took issue with at least one of the charges against him, which was that of the assassination of Richard Stevens, uh, who was a patriot leader, and which Eliff vehemently denied. And said He did a whole bunch of other stuff, but he denied actually uh, having committed that assassination. He then went on to explain his service from the Crown, stating, quote, from the prejudices in which he was educated, and the strong presuppositions he had imbibed of the necessary dependence of the colonies on the parent state, and essential to the supply of their various wants and high ideals, he had entertained of the power of Great Britain to compel their subordination. But the trial of Eliff, uh, overseen by New Jersey Chief Justice Robert Morris, right? so we got Livingston, we got Morris's, we've got all the counties and towns in New Jersey. Uh, he was described as, as one of the leaders of the recruitment, this assassination attempt, and some other stuff. So the New Jersey Supreme Court carried out the sentence of death. Livingston was in Princeton, uh, but these two men were executed in Morristown in early December of 1777. And a loyalist then living in Morristown wrote to the British commander, Sir Henry Clinton, saying, quote, during his confinement, talking about Eliff, and at the place of execution, he behaved with great calmness and fortitude declaring that he had acted from a principle of duty to his king and enjoyed the satisfaction of an improving conscience in his last moments. Now remember, there's still nine men who were slated for execution the following month that are still in jail in Morristown. The gallows was erected so that it would be in full view of those nine men in jail so they could see exactly what was happening. And then, and this is a direct quote from this letter, the corpse of Eliff and me were drawn on a sled from under the gallows and thrown into the room in which Dr. Foreman and his companions are confined in irons, and the gallows remain erected in view of the prison window. Those men later were part. So this is a civil war, and this is Livingston saying, again, 72 men, he executes two of them, and that was really consistent with how that kind of power and capital punishment worked at the time. Um, but it shows you exactly how Livingston was interpreting his responsibility for trying to maintain unity and trying to ensure that New Jersey remained on. Livingston is fascinating. One of the, one of the ways, and I didn't, I, I had it in the presentation, but it didn't seem to fit with where we were going, was talking about Livingston as very much a man of the Enlightenment, right? And you get that in this fancy philosophic solitude poem written at the same time that the French Enlightenment is peaking with Voltaire and. Um, uh, Rousseau, right? I mean, uh, Livingston is in, we'll get to his book list in a second, and we'll see how, just how well read he really is, even by, even by our standards. So he's very much styles himself as an intellectual, um, but he's willing to do the hard work of governing when it's, when it's required. Um, so again, this is Livingston showing that, you know, to me, Livingston's experience shows that this is very much a civil war in New Jersey, and, and that's, I think, a key point to highlight, and it also you know, highlights the challenges of, of serving as a governor. But to jump a little bit, so this is, so one of the documents that we have is Livingston's book list. So these are the books that are in his library that we have. And it's a 24 page, it's a 24 page document. And so we had a couple of different students that have done 
work on it. And this is a visualization. So this is Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, one of the foundational texts for the American Constitution. Right? And so then we created this visualization. Right? So we can zoom in on this book, and then these are all of the different founders, and you can see the web of their different books, and also who had it in their collection. So we see here that it was, on the, it was in the libraries that we know of, of Livingston, John Jay, who's Livingston's son-in-law, Jefferson Adams, Madison, Robert R. Livingston, Livingston's brother, and Philip Schuyler. Uh, we looked at eight or nine book lists total. Uh, Washington and Franklin are the others that we have. I'm surprised that it's not in Franklin. Again, these are imperfect, because books are easy to lose, and some, right, we've all had some come borrow a book that they haven't returned. Deborah works in a library, she's probably had that experience as well, right? So, but so what this visualization does is it, it can show us what the founders were reading in common, and it, and it shows essentially these kind of intellectual networks that, um, that they had in common. And so this is one of our student projects from, actually she just presented last, about uh, two weeks ago at, at King's Research Days. And then this is another larger project um, that has all of the documents of uh, so, so this breaks it down. So this is what Livingston and, and Jefferson have in common. And, and one of our working hypotheses, as we've learned more about Livingston, is that he's a better Jefferson than Jefferson. And I say that as someone who went to and graduated from Thomas Jefferson High School. So I still, my partner, right, calls it, she calls it my, he's my troublesome fave, right? Mm -hmm. The kids talk about, like, their problematic fave, like, Jefferson is my problematic fave. Because Jefferson is usually problematic, but he's also Jefferson. Um, and and so, but but I'm coming around to the idea that Livingston is more a man of the Enlightenment even than, than Jefferson of the American Enlightenment at least, than Jefferson. Is. And so, just with this visualization, then we we have the ability to look at um, all of the different books that that these men had in common. Through the power of Google, our students are able to actually because most of these are 300 years old, so they're you know they've been archived through Google Books, and so you can actually get into the, the book. And all of this is, is available on our, so this is just a shout out for our William Livingston's World Project website. So again, this is your federal tax dollars at work. Um, but we have created what is the best hub for all things William Livingston. Um, so we've got a tremendous, so we've got a, a, a short bio and then a longer bio, which I look forward to New Jersey High School and, and elementary school students copying and pasting for a long, long time. I'm looking forward to that. Um, we have a, a number of kind of short essays that either Dr. Beth and I or, or our students have written on a, on a number of topics related to Livingston. And then we have a couple of, we have three teaching with Livingston units. We're actually doing a teacher's workshop in two weeks, um, particularly focused on history of slavery and enslaved persons and women as a larger part of William Livingston's world. We've got a number of, of documents. So one of the challenges with studying Livingston is that his papers are such a mess, and what we found is that his, his one son had some of the papers, and then his daughter had, the, uh, had a bunch of others, and they ended up in two different libraries. So a bunch of Livingston stuff is up in Massachusetts because his daughter married a Massachusetts guy, and so the stuff ended up there, and then his son Brockholz who left Liberty Hall as soon as his father died, and went back to New York, has a bunch of stuff in the New York Public Library. So they've all been microfilmed, but they're not, they didn't go through and put them in order, which someone like me who is a historian and likes things to be in chronological order, like they didn't do that. So it's really, really hard to track this stuff, but it, one of the things that we've tried to do um, is to track down and, and create this single hub of, um, of Livingston's world and and things regarding and primary source documents, for example. So this is a primary document. So this is a document that we found in the Liberty Hall archives, um, and it's not particularly easy to read. But it's we call it the Bill of Lumber because on this front side, it has a request for a thousand palmetto logs, a bunch of other lumber and building materials. Um, 
that Livingston is making. And then in a way that, because paper is really rare, even for someone as wealthy as Livingston, they have math all over, and they don't have calculators, right? So they're having to do this math by hand. They have, um, they just have math equations on the bottom. But if you turn it over onto the second page, on the back of this page, is this document, and it has a list of names of enslaved persons. And it includes, for the women, if they bore any children, and how many? Over here we have how many have been sold, so 10, and we have four that have died. And this is just one example of a number of documents that we have that enable us to write. So, so one, of the, one of the main things as we're trying to recover the history of the enslaved who in many ways don't appear in these records otherwise is to, is to get the names and to identify the names. And we don't really have the ability to identify the names through the census records or, or genealogically, it's very, very difficult. Um, but just having these names at least enables us to ensure that, they're, that we're able to try and recover some amount of, of that story and, and of that history that we're, that we're telling. So, okay, so, okay. So again, the Livingstons in slavery. So Columbia University, to which the, a lot of Livingston money was donated, has done a project, not so much William Livingston, but the larger Livingston family, and so it's that wealth that educated him that enabled him to retire at 46. Man, Livingston was younger than me when he retired. I'm missing out. Anyway, so um, they've done a major project looking at their roots and connections to the Livingston family and other enslavers from the state of New York. So the Livingston family as a whole in the 1790 census, owned a, owned a total, claimed ownership over a total of 170 enslaved persons. And just as we saw in that Bill of Lumber document, um, the enslaved show up in some of these other records, uh, some of these other records as well. So this is a document from 1782, paid to Mr. Dafford, um, one $8 state bill to settle, and it's, um, made a pair of shoes for my Negro boy, and, and then over here, this again is um, essentially repairing a pair of shoes for myself to mend, to mend Will's shoes, which would have been William, his son, uh, to make a pair of something shoes and shoes for Hannah Benjamin to make an apron for Will because it's leather, right? To make shoes with a silk heel to mend my leather uppers to seal Will uh, Will's boots and to seal the top piece of uh, my wench's shoes, which is a term that they would have used for an instant right. So these are receipts in Livingston's hand about the enslaved people that, that he claimed ownership, right? So to be clear, Livingston did not own, and this is another one, again, related to shoes, pair uh, wench uppers, pair one pair of my Negro boy uppers, mending my Negro's boots. Right? And then this is, uh, this is the expense. So this is, those early ones from 1782, this is 1782, and it goes back a couple of years. If you said that Livingston's even more Jeffersonian than Jefferson, mm -hmm. and yet Jefferson writes, all men are created equal, and yet there's that issue of slavery. How do they justify the non sequiturs? If we could answer that one, we could understand their world. A, we could understand their world a lot better. I think for the most part, they so. Right, so Jefferson writes all men are created equal, claims ownership over, over 240 enslaved persons during his lifetime, has a long-standing intimate and sexual relationship with a woman who was enslaved to him, um, and who bears him, multiple, who bears him multiple children, who by the laws of Virginia and the custom at the time are enslaved to him. Um, he doesn't manumit anyone. Jefferson himself doesn't manumit any of his enslaved 
persons, persons enslaved to him. Um, Livingston does, and we'll, and we'll get to that. So for, for Jefferson, the, the compartmentalization and the disconnect, there are a number of hypotheses, none of which I find to be particularly, particularly satisfying. I think in part because Jefferson isn't grappling. Uh, Jefferson's not really grappling with the depth of slavery, and Livingston is, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Um, so you could argue that Livingston just doesn't see enslaved persons, black persons, as, as people. And so you can write all men are created equal because you're really only talking about white men anyway. White men. Yeah. In the Civil War, they talk about the mud silk generation. Yeah. Is it reflecting itself this early in the terms of this natural aristocracy and privilege of the Um, There's some of that. Uh, that language really comes after 1830 when during the revolution, um, right, they're much more grappling with slavery as a necessary evil. And, and Jefferson talks about this, right? Jefferson talks in, in, in his notes on the state of Virginia, he talks about, we have a wolf by the ear in terms of talking about the institution of slavery. He refers to it as we have a wolf by the ears. And we can't hang on and we can't let go. And so, and, and, and so, what, do, and so what do we do? And for Jefferson, Slavery was a, was very much a necessary evil. He wished that they could get rid of it, but he didn't really see a way how. After about 1830, as the abolitionist movement in the North increases its intensity and, and ramps up their rhetoric against the institution in general, you have many more, more Southerners defending slavery, not as a necessary evil, but as a positive good. And that's where you get that Munso argument. It's basically, the rest of us can enjoy democracy because the laboring class, if, if we let the there's all of this fear, and it's rooted in classical philosophy, that if you let the laboring classes work, vote, then they're going to vote to take all the money from the rich people and give it to themselves, right? And so the South basically says, we've solved that problem by enslaving the people who are really doing the work, and we're not going to let them vote, and so then we can just argue against, amongst each other, but we don't have to worry about them coming for us. And that's essentially the argument that you get from the 1830s until the 1860s, particularly in the South, but some in the North too. I mean, the South doesn't have the market cornered on racism, plenty of racism in the North, um, to, to, make that, to make that case, right? But so Livingston is grappling with those inconsistencies, those philosophical inconsistencies, the intellectual inconsistencies, but also the, the political realities, right? And so this is a letter to Samuel Allenson. Allenson was a prominent Quaker who were among the leading abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates, not just in New Jersey, but nationally at the time. So, um, so Livingston and Allison have, Allison have a couple of exchanges, but this one is particularly good, right? And so I sent a message to the assembly, the very last session, to lay the foundation for their manumission. But the House, thinking us rather in too critical a situation to enter on the consideration of it at that time, desired me in a private way to withdraw the message. So basically, and, and Livingston makes this case in a, in a number of letters with Allenson and with others, basically saying, I was really trying to push New Jersey to adopt, to pass some kind of manumission law, gradual emancipation, whatever, and he couldn't get it passed politically. Because there were too many people who said, well, you know, is it really a good idea to do that in the middle of a war? And then later on it would be, well, we just fought a war and we need to make money back, so we can't really do that yet. And then, and, and the political reality is such that a majority of the New Jersey Assembly are in favor of preserving slavery. They're not going to vote even for gradual emancipation or some kind of compensated emancipation. But Livingston is grappling with it. And the, the most obvious place that we see him grapple with it is with this letter to the New York Manumission Society in 1786. So New Jersey does not have a Manumission Society. And one of the co-founders of the New Jersey Manumission Society or of the New York Manumission Society is Livingston's son-in-law, John Jay, who himself claimed ownership over slaves, going so far as to bring persons enslaved to him and his wife with him when he was over in Europe, one of whom runs away, and he gets Ben Franklin to work with the French authorities in Paris to throw her in jail. Um, but so this is a letter that Livingston writes in 1786, so in his private capacity. I mean, he's still governor, obviously, but he's not writing as governor, and basically asking if, 
sending, sending the Jews money to join the New York Manumission Society. Right? And so he says, here I can safely promise, neither my tongue nor my pen nor my purse shall be wanting to promote the abolition of what to me appears so inconsistent with humanity and Christianity, and so inevitably perpetuating of an indelible blot with all the nations of Europe upon the character of those who have so strongly asserted the unalienable rights of mankind. So that's exactly what you were talking about. Right? That it's pretty obvious that we're being hypocritical here when we talk about ourselves as the bastion of liberty and fighting for uh, liberty and independence and the pursuit of happiness, um, but maintaining and, and advocating for slavery. So Livingston does put his money where his mouth is, if you will. Um, and he manumits and sets at liberty a certain Negro woman called Belle and her child, whose name is Lambert, from any services to me or my representatives as fully and effectually to the extent and purposes whatsoever as if they had been born first free. And so Livingston does this in 1785. Positive check on the ledger for Livingston. Livingston follows up in 1788 in a letter to James Pemberton. So this is uh, an act for the gradual abolition of slavery, which Livingston once again tries to get passed in 1788, and once again can't. And so it's not until 1803 that New Jersey, so 13 years after Livingston died, it's not until 1803 that Livingston that New Jersey passes a law for gradual emancipation. And New Jersey is the last northern state to do so. And that law basically said that any person born to an enslaved woman after January 1st, 1804 would be enslaved for 25 years and then, win, and then win their freedom. But anyone born before that didn't necessarily have to be manumitted by their owner. So you still have, it's fewer than 100, but you still have around 60 or 80 enslaved persons living in New Jersey at the start of the civil Livingston is also at the Constitutional Convention. He's not once, he's still governor. This is, is summer of 1787. He's still governor. He's not one of the first uh, men elected to be part of the New Jersey delegation, but two people say, I'm not going to put up with this, and so Livingston says that he will go. Um, now, Livingston is, is famously known as being a brilliant writer, and I've tried to display that through some of the letters that we've shared. He's a terrible public speaker by all accounts. Adams makes fun of his public speaking. Someone else makes fun of his public speaking. Um, but he's a gifted leader. He is a man who knows how to work compromises. He, is a, he has done nothing but deal with kind of tricky political calculations uh, for the last 12 years, if not longer. And so he actually chairs one of the final committees in August and into September of 1788 that's trying to make the final compromise, right? So there's two, there's essentially two large compromises. The compromise on having a popularly elected house based on population and then a Senate where every state, whether you're Wyoming or California, gets two members of the Senate. It doesn't matter on your population. That's, that's the great compromise, right? Then you have the three-fifths compromise, which allows the South to count um, enslaved persons as three-fifths of a person. That doesn't mean that the South thought slaves were three-fifths of a person. They thought they were much less but politically it was advantageous for them to count them in that way. But there's a bunch of other compromises, and Livingston is basically on the committee that's overseeing those compromises um, at the time. One is on the slave trade, and so the, the Livingston's committee basically says that the international slave trade, so the ability to import enslaved persons from Africa or the West Indies, and Livingston gets his committee to agree to it only lasting until 1800, so from 1788 to 1800. Now when it goes back to the full convention, the South Carolina delegation basically says, we're not agreeing to this if it's any earlier than 1808. So Livingston actually gets a better deal than what's in the Constitution, which is it can't be barred any earlier than 1808. It's also Livingston, I hesitate to bring this up, but I'll mention it, that oversaw the language with regard to the rules on impeachment and the guidelines on impeachment that are in the Constitution. So it was Livingston that basically drafted and wrote that language. Um, he had some help on it, but it was his committee that came up with, uh, that came up with that. 
So at the Constitutional Convention, Livingston is, is very much a player. He doesn't appear, again, he doesn't speak very much, and so we don't have his voice very much involved in the, in the Constitutional Convention. Um, but we know from the committees that he was on and the prominent roles that he played on those committees that he did play an important, an important role in them. And he also plays a role, of, again, a much quieter role, in getting New Jersey to ratify the Constitution. Uh, the main studies of ratification don't spend a lot of time on New Jersey. New Jersey is the third state to ratify the Constitution. It does so um, very quickly. The state ratification convention in, only meets in Trenton for six days. There are no minutes or, or record that we have of what actually transpired in that meeting. And this is a very fuzzy um, listing of the men who were at that convention by county. So this is Essex, um, Monmouth, Burlington, um, of the men who, 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 who were involved in it. But Livingston um, does advocate strongly. He writes to a, a colleague, Jedediah Morris, in Connecticut. I can inform you of one fact which gives me great pleasure. It is that both the branches of our legislature were unanimous in laying before the people the Constitution planned by the late convention. And he found, quote, great pleasure that the New Jersey legislature had acted expediently in, in uh, proceeding in the ratification process. Uh, and he said, I hope and doubt not that the citizens of Connecticut will be as ready to adopt the Constitution as I have reason to think we shall. And then I think we shall soon make my native country, New York, a little sickish of their opposition to it. And, and New York was a much, that's where the Federalist Papers come from, was the debate over ratification in, in New York originally. Yeah. Could you talk about the women, particularly Abigail Adams and, and Hamilton's daughter, her uh, uh, first daughter. These are bright women. How do men, drawing up a, a constitution, ignore the fact that that women are bright and, and do not have any property rights to speak of when they get married. I mean, there was no model for giving women political rights or, um, well, we can talk about that. So there's really no model for giving women political rights or any kind of economic freedom. I mean, women couldn't own or get a credit card in her own name until 1972. But, so, but women could vote in New Jersey. So when New Jersey passes its constitution in 1776, the way it's written is that any person who has 50 pounds of, owns 50 pounds of property or estate can vote. And at a time, there was a thought that they were just kind of lazy when they wrote it that way and didn't think that women and like a free black person who had that much estate could vote. But more research shows that it actually was done consciously to let women vote. Because a woman who was a widow and who didn't have any child, a, a son of age would have essentially a, you know, inherited property of more than 50 pounds. She wouldn't have a man that she would be, that, that would be owned to and entitled to. And so therefore, she would, have, she would meet the qualifications of voting. And in elections, the most famous one is the Senate election and county election in Essex County. So in Newark, in 1797, both the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party are writing a poems and op-eds, what you would consider op-eds, but basically newspaper pieces, trying to get women that would support their candidate out to vote. And more than 200 women did vote, for example, in that Essex County election. And then in 1807, all the men got together and looked at each other and said, that, you know what, this is really a terrible idea. And so they went back and specifically put men back in the, in the document for the next 100 plus years. And how about black people then? Did any black people? There, so there are a couple. I know that there were some in Hunterdon County, again, that had um, either bought their freedom or had been manumitted and, and met the property qualification. Um, there's a pair of scholars that, that did a project. It's rooted in a cemetery project, but then they used that to do some of the genealogy. Um, and the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia did an exhibit that talked about that focused specifically on New Jersey, because New Jersey was unique among the states that did that, that had it written in that way. So there is this brief moment where women and, and a handful of free blacks that meet the, prop, the property qualification could, could vote. Um, you know, the larger argument with regard to women, so there's this notion of Republican, what, what, what's called Republican motherhood. And the idea was that in a, democ a democracy would only work if, if men were educated. And 
these Republican men were going to be off busy running businesses and running the country, and so education was a maternal duty, and so you couldn't have Republican sons if you didn't have Republican moms to educate them. And so that's kind of how they advocate for women being able to be educated and even receiving a classical education, so it's not just sewing and whatever, but a classical education, a woman's education, a girl's education would be a little bit different than a boy's education, but it had math, it had some classical philosophy and things like that. And then, so, so part of it is the education role, and then the other part is that these educated Republican men are going to want to marry an educated Republican woman. And so, essentially, to make their daughters more attractive on the marriage market, they would need to be, they would need to be educated. Um, so they're not playing formal political roles, but they are supporting the institution of democracy, they're supporting the state, they're supporting the country. Yeah? I can see us going back to Plato's Republic, <laughs> where there's a division of class, so you have this higher echelon, and women at some point falling into that class where they're not entitlement, so to speak. And almost like it's almost a class society argument. I still see one of that. But basically, I'm going to focus on that. As in, and the other issue I have is there's a eugenics movement that comes out. Is there anything in the eugenics movement post-Civil War, I guess it is. But is there anything like a eugenics movement in that very pre-Civil American Revolution? Not that, not that often where they literally see some people as more inferior or more superior than others? Well, I mean, you have the, you have the same, you know, eugenics becomes scientifically based, right? So people are looking at brain size and then they want to use, you know, the, the, the first one is the, is the, the intellectual test that's used by the U.S. Army at the start of World War I and that reveals just how illiterate America is and things like that, right? But it's all rooted in, it's all rooted in racism. Um, What's that? You don't you don't have that to the same ex you, you don't have it, it's not a scientifically based I mean it's you know it's clear that enslaved people are inferior and black people even if they are not enslaved are overall inferior. There's always an exception. Phil Sweetley is an incredibly gifted poet and things like that. But for the but there's not an effort so 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 it's in many ways it's best thought of as a caste system. It's about the, talks about the inferiority and colonization, right? So, so the model is send them back to Africa. Is and and there's a massive colonization. There's a there's a major colonization movement that Madison, Jefferson, and others are in favor of and financially supporting. In from about 1812 into the 1820s, that's where that's where the creation of Liberia comes from. It's basically, they purchase that land, and the idea is we're going to take for we're going to we're going to emancipate <coughs> enslaved people, but we can't have them, we can't let them live here, and so we send them back. In Virginia, when they have a moment of a man, you miss you, man, you meant, uh, an enslaved person, they can't stay in Virginia, they have to get out. Because they, they're, they're, they're direly, dearly afraid of this free black population. Uh, so again, we talked about the limits, we talked about the limits of, of emancipation, um, so the 1804 gradual emancipation law, servitude replaces slavery, Many manumissions require a continuation of, of service, and so this is an emancipation where um, you know, my Negro man named Prince, uh, 31 years, is manumitted and set free um, with witness thereof, but typically they had to remain in service to the person who um, claimed, had previously claimed ownership over them. This is one in the Kane archive. So this is um, Susan Vambro Livingston Kane and say that she was married to the original John Kane. So the, the Kane family is not native to New Jersey. They actually come from South Carolina. And John Kane of South Carolina, who's a member of the Confederation Congress in New York, marries a, a, a Livingston, Governor William Livingston's niece. She eventually buys Liberty Hall, which is why we have her paper. And this is a four-page document manumitting Peter and Sarah Van Horn, who had previously been enslaved to her, and she does so in 1829, so essentially 25 years after that gradual emancipation law. So she's keeping it with the spirit of that. It says here, his mark and her mark, and it's marked with an X. 
this to me is the most powerful document we have in the Liberty Hall collection because this is a document that was touched by enslaved people and it's them making their mark, showing that they're not literate, but them making their mark on a piece of paper. You can see it, it's real. That was essentially them being manumitted, but being manumitted on condition that they remain as servants at Liberty Hall for a salary of 50 pounds a year, which was not a terrible salary, but basically, congratulations, you're free, nothing's really changed. Yeah. And there's an argument that mentally something has changed, right? I mean, that, that, that there is, hopefully we never find out, but that there is uh, you know, a, a mental distinction between being enslaved and being free, right? But at the same time, for a lot of these emancipated people, um, not much has happened. So that's William Williamson's world. Well, that's a piece of William Williamson's world. We've got a whole giant website, which I would love for you to go take a look at, uh, that offers some more both context and just essays, but also a lot of documents that, that you can go through. I think every document that I have in, in here is there. Uh, you know, This is the history of New Jersey. This is the history of America. This is the history of the Enlightenment. This is the history of, of slavery. I, I'm glad to take them. I appreciate everyone being here.